Hey guys, Ken Smith, Ken Smith Fishing. Now I know I had told y'all we would be doing fork video today, but if you don't know, fork got postponed. Uh, there was potential for bad weather on Saturday morning and they canceled the tournament. They didn't cancel it, they postponed the tournament. And I gotta tell you for two reasons I'm thrilled they did. Number one, uh, I was not excited about fishing in 37, 38 degree rain. We've already done that once this year and it was not any fun. And number two, we all got sick as dogs Friday night. Our little one brought home some kind of stomach bug, and man, we were all so sick. If this tournament had been going down, I'd have had to call Terry at about four in the morning because we were going in my boat and say, man, I'm sorry, but you got to load it and go yourself. So really happy that tournament got canceled for a bunch of reasons. And it also allowed me to go ahead and post up some video this week that I've been working on. So I told you guys about this. Uh, this is John Finn Dyson. Now, John is Todd Driscoll's counterpart at Texas Park on Wildlife. And, and we'll get into exactly who he is, but he's the guy that is over uh, invasive species, aquatic vegetation for the entire state of Texas. So all the questions you guys have been posing to me about where'd the grass go, what are they doing, you know, blah, 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 blah. I cover every bit of this with John. We talked for way over an hour. There's probably four or five parts here. I think you're really, really going to enjoy. Now, let me let me start out first. This first video, I was in the, the furthest part of the house trying to get away from the chaos of this house because it was in the afternoon and the kids were, you know, rattling around and doing stuff. And we had some buffering issues. So you'll see a little bit of delay on some of the answers, but that gets cleaned up early on in part two. And also, I recorded this exactly the way I recorded the video with Todd on Zoom, and for some reason, I don't show up in the frame. I don't miss not looking at myself. I think I said that right. I don't think you guys will either. You can hear my voice fine, and uh, you'll get the whole gist of this. So, And I will promise you one thing. In either part two or part three, he's going to talk about hydrilla in the state of Texas, and I believe in most of the South. And he's going to talk about something I never heard, did not know was the reason why hydrilla doesn't grow down here as well as it does in some other parts of the country. And it's going to blow your mind when you hear what he has to say. So I think you'll enjoy this. Again, the video gets better in part two, the video itself. And we just continue to get into really interesting content. And he's already told me we're going to do a follow-up. We're going to do it in an airboat. We're going to look at some different grasses and some different stuff too, I think. And so as always, guys, Post your questions in the comments or shoot me an email at kensmithfishing at outlook.com and I'll get those questions posted to John and we'll share them with everybody. So let's jump right in here and uh, have our conversation with John. Hey guys, Ken Smith, Ken Smith Fishing. Welcome to another edition of me getting to talk to guys at Texas Park and Wildlife. So we're joined today by John Van Dyson. Uh, John, your title, I believe, is Aquatic Invasive Species Biologist. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah. For a functional title, that that definitely works. So, right. And you uh, sat right next door to Mr. Griscoll. Is that correct? Yes, I do. In fact, I, I yes, his office is right behind mine. I got you. Now, so you're a Texas A&M undergrad, right? Yes, sir. And tell me about your undergrad. I, I did my <laughs> undergrad at A&M. I, I in fisheries management. Uh, I got to work for several graduate students and got a lot of experience from that. I uh, went to work for Parks and Wildlife as a seasonal employee in May of 93. I uh, did that from May till I guess it was the end of October. And then from there went to Southwest Texas State University and got my master's there in biology with the emphasis in aquatic biology. Okay. So you are the guy in control of all the black helicopters, right? I, everybody thinks so. I'm the only one who doesn't know where these helicopters are. So I don't even have keys for them. So, <laughs> so excuse me, guys. <clears throat> for those of you who don't know what we're joking about, there is, uh, for a long time, I've heard guys talk about they've seen black helicopters out spraying the grass at night on Rayburn or Toledo or uh, all kinds of crazy stuff we hear down there about what's going on, which is exactly why we want to talk to you, John. Right. Yeah, I got a crazy story about that. We were on, oh, Lake Fork. This is years ago after I'd moved up from uh, doing the fish management job for Parks and Wildlife down in South Texas. I just started out here. We were on Lake Fork and ran into an angler, and he said he recognized me he, from uh, the doorway of the helicopter one afternoon that I was 
sweeping uh, copper sulfate off. So I asked him specifically, I was like, what year? And he said, oh, that would have been 1983. I was like, well, that's impossible. I was in junior high then. But, you know, he insisted <laughs> that that it was me in the helicopter. So very nice. The door gunner in the Texas Park and Wildlife black helicopter. Right. Exactly. Please. So got gotcha. you. All right. So th this is exactly why we want to talk to you. So there's <clears throat> always rampant rumors. There's guys on every fishing forum that know way more than anybody else about what you guys are doing. But you're the dude, right? You're the guy basically in charge of this part of Texas for controlling invasive species. Well, for the whole state of Texas. Okay. Uh, there, my team is composed of six uh, uh, individuals. I have myself as a team leader. We have an assistant biologist and then four technicians. And that's it for aquatic vegetation treatment control across the state. So talk to me first about what is an invasive species. Uh, we're talking about species that are non-native to this area, uh, stuff that's been brought in from other countries, other continents, uh, things that don't have natural controls here. Uh, you know, we don't have the, the natural herbivores on this, uh, whether that's in insects or mammals or fish. Uh, also things, you know, they're outside of their normal range of bacterial or viral controls. Uh, so, you know, because you don't have that control, it's in a, a new area it allows that that to flourish and whether that's a plant or an animal like you know with the uh invasive carp which you see now throughout the united states or even you know the zebra mussels and now the quagga mussel in the state of texas so in a nutshell you know that's that's it it's just something that's that's not native to this area but are, are you so i hadn't thought about this by the way guys we've had a, john and i've had a conversation before this call to kind of figure out what we want to talk about but i didn't think about that so your is, uh, <clears throat> I'm thinking zebra mussel. Zebra mussel is not a vegetation, so that wouldn't fall under you? No, they, that's actually, a, a, I have, there's another counterpart I have in Austin, and she oversees our, our zebra mussel, quagga mussel, and invasive carp. Uh, there is another streamy, uh, a group that focuses on salt cedar and oh, uh, the Arundo, the giant cane. But as far as like aquatic vegetation stuff, stuff growing in the lake, that's us. Okay. And in Texas, that's going to be uh, water hyacinth, giant salvania, and hydrilla, right? Right. Hydrilla falls in that category, but it's it's not as is it. In some instances, it's it's it can be invasive, but you know, in, in some of our larger reservoirs, it seems to really be of benefit, uh, especially to our our bass fisheries. Wait a minute. Uh, Did you guys just hear that? John said the hydrilla can be a benefit. Yes. Yes. And, and that was one of the things I got to see for 20 years down in South Texas was when Choke Canyon was full and we had lots of hydrilla, the, the fishing was phenomenal down there. You go back to 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, you know, 15 pound fish were being caught, 50 pound limits were being caught. And, and we would go back and look and it, we had a lot of hydrilla growth in that reservoir at the time. Yeah. So, and, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, well, what, what, so let's talk about this. So you, in our, in our last conversation, you said really what y'all are trying to control is the Salvania and the Hyson, correct? Correct. But that the Hydrilla, uh, although sometimes it is somewhat impacted because of the control of the other two, it's really not what you're trying to control because it can be a benefit. Right, exactly. And what, what you were getting at is, you know, sometimes we do have a little bit of overspray on it. Uh, Caddo Lake, we spray currently this last year, I want to say it was right around 73, 7,500 acres of giant salvinia throughout the year. Uh, that's down from pre prior to 2018 when it was almost 10,000 acres a year. But, you know, what we'll see with the, with the uh, hydrilla control is maybe that upper inch or two of it as some of these herbicides drip off into the water just that upper inch or two of hydrilla you know it may bleach it turn it white but it doesn't kill it all right so you talked to me before a little bit about there are multiple types of herbicide am i getting that right yes herbicide yes that some of it actually kills what it touches and some of it actually permeates the plant i know that's not the right term but actually right. Yeah, what we had talked about were systemic herbicides. Uh, those herbicides 
bed that permeate into the plant and then are circulated throughout the plant. So not only is it killing the leaf, but you're getting the stems in the root system. An, an example of that that we use quite a bit in, in here uh, is panoxylum. And then uh, the other one, and I'll use the chemical name rather than the brand name. And the other one is glyphosate. Uh, now we go on the opposite of that. That and you're, you've got contact herbicides. Uh, these will be things like diquat and flumioxazin. And think of like paint. It only kills that part of the plant that it touches. And so and it's not circulated, right? When do you use one over the other? It really depends on what the objective is. Uh, if, uh, if we're concerned about a lot of overspray and non target impacts, we can go in with the contact herbicide because then we're not, you know, let's say that there's a, a mat of salvinia mixed in with uh, American Lotus. We know that any of that herbicide that gets on the American Lotus, it will burn that pad, but it's not going to take that back to the stem or the root. So that American Lotus will then recover from that herbicide treatment while the salvinia plant, which got coated, would actually die from it. What uh, is American Lotus, by the way? The, the great big lily pads that you see, you know, the one, it, it doesn't have a split in it. Uh, it'll have the big, in the fall, you'll see what looks like the shower heads, uh, the big seed pods, the brown seed pods in it. And that's a native plant here in Texas. Gotcha. Uh, you know, where other, we go, you know, let's say we have large mats like we do up at Caddo Lake. You know, you may, you may be treating a 40 acre mat of salvinia. Well, we can go in with that systemic herbicide and we're, we've been mixing that here recently with the contact herbicide that work along the same time period of 10 to 14 days so we have two modes of attack on this on the self video going on it first of all helps prevent resistance against the herbicide you know we don't want to do that florida has uh strains of hydrilla that are resistant to sonar uh but with by by using it's resistant to what sonar another herbicide that they had okay. used to treat years ago. Anyway, it's, it's sonar resistant. But with these big mats, we know that you, the wind or wave action is going to, or even in flows into the reservoir, are going to have the potential to break that mat up. So if we can take that mat, even if it's broken up, you know, within that 10 to 40 day period, you know, before it truly dies, we know that that, that mat has gone, it's going to kill the entire salvinia plant, no matter where it goes. So it's not going to create an issue elsewhere. The one bad thing about systemic or uh, contact herbicides is that if we don't get enough herbicide on there, the plant will recover from it. Right. And so, you, and I'm, I know I'm jumping around a little bit, but you actually, <clears throat> I think I asked you in the first video, you, or not you, but Parker Wildlife kind of knows where the first salvinia showed up in Texas, right? Yes, yeah, that was, I believe that was 1998. It was a small pond outside of Houston. And the belief is it got there how? Uh, from the ornamental planting industry, these the individuals that go out and have the water gardens in the backyard, uh, that's where it, it came to the United States from. I mean, I'm, uh, it's possible it could have come in through the aquarium industry as well, but more than likely, there's a big. Uh, well, I say a big group. It's a, a small group of people that that have these backyard water gardens. Of when I was in Corpus, I, I got to see some of them, and they had water hyacinth and water lettuce, and you know a lot of these plants that are on the prohibited list. Uh, and that was before Salvinia, so that that's you know definitely where it came from. Now, the Tawita Bin infestation probably ended up coming over from the Louisiana side of it more so than than somebody releasing a tank on the Texas side, right. Right. All right. So, so back to your talking about the herbicides. Mm -hmm. So we'll get to what has killed the grass, but you made a comment to me about how much of Toledo and Rayburn y'all have even sprayed over the last few years. Can you talk right. about that? Yeah, we've with Toledo Ben when I, and, and I just started this job in 2016. I say just started. It's been six years ago. Uh, time flies when you're having fun, they say. Uh, we've, the treatments then were well over 5,000 acres a year. Uh, when we first got here, we were alerted to an issue in Lowe's Creek where the Lowe's Creek was completely denuded. Uh, so we wanted to figure out why. Why was that? Was that because well, what, the entire... Explain what that term means. There was no vegetation in Lowe's Creek at okay. that point. We went and looked. There was a little bit of aquatic plants growing, but it wasn't enough to create any type of fish habitat. Uh, the... 
the torpedo grass or hay grass that had been in there was all gone. And our question was, okay, we know herbicide treatments have been in, have been being conducted in this creek and fairly heavily. What are it, but we had used several different types of herbicide at that time. So we wanted to know what herbicides were actually having the the most detrimental impact on on that plant, especially the torpedo grass. I worked with Todd on it. I don't figure out what, what the original, I say original, what the, the habitat was in Lowe's Creek. So that way we could, we could go back and simulate that elsewhere. Uh, so working with Todd, we ended up setting up a, a little experiment over at Needmore Point there on. Uh, All right, that seemed like a good place to break. So we'll come back, we'll talk about the experiment they performed about Toledo Bend over at Needmore Point on Reverend. It's pretty interesting what they did and what they discovered. So stick with us. I think you're really gonna enjoy this series of videos. Uh, really, really bright dude who knows his aquatic vegetation. And, and interestingly, I didn't talk about this earlier. He's also a bass fisherman. His son is a, a high school fisherman. He fishes a lot in central Texas from his past when he was stationed over there and now in East Texas. So this guy cares about just like Todd does. I think that's part of our advantage with especially the East Texas guys. We got a couple of guys who are interested in tournament fishing working in Texas Park and Wildlife Department. And that's the case, by the way, across the state as well. That really makes for a better, better management. They're managing for fishing like we would manage for fishing if we knew what the heck we were doing. So I'm really enjoying doing this. I hope you guys enjoyed as well. Probably we'll have part two of this up this Thursday. I'm traveling this week, got to go to Austin and, uh, Gosh, I got something else going on. Oh, I can't get out this weekend because Sarah's out of town. So stick around. We got a lot more good stuff coming for you. Still trying to get some 10 boat reviews done. As soon as we get those done, I'll get those posted up as well, guys. Thanks for tuning in.